Welcome to A Model Steamboat Named Edith. This is part 16 and it's about the radio control system. I decided to buy a good quality radio control system for this boat and how times have changed. This radio control system is made by a company called Futaba and I've personally used Futaba radio for many years and I still have an excellent Futaba Zap 9 set upstairs in a box which still works just as well as it always has done. Unlike the Zap 9, this is a very simple Futaba radio set, and it's just what I need for the Steamboat Edith. This set does not have any computer displays or any fancy gadgetry. All I need it to control on this particular steamboat is the rudder, the regulator, and the gas cutoff valve. The owner of the boat is of a great age, and he really would not appreciate a computer radio. I bought this radio set from a model shop in Leeds, and very good it is too. And while I was there, I bought some paint. Two pots of grey paint and one pot of brown paint. I also bought a battery box and a switch harness. And once again, for ease of operation, this radio set is going to use dry cells rather than using rechargeable batteries. While I was at the model shop, I bought some of these. Now these are really, really good, just what I was looking for. I didn't buy them to paint Edith the steamboat, I bought them to paint my Stirling single steam locomotive at a later date. I was very pleased with this purchase though. Look at this. Two metre lengths of mahogany, which is two millimetres thick and about 12 millimetres wide. Perfect for planking the decks of steamboats, or if I trim the planks using my bandsaw, they're going to be really good for cladding boilers. So on with the show. This is a six channel transmitter, four channels on the sticks then one channel on a switch, and channel number six that I'm not going to use is on a knob at the right hand side at the top. I'll switch it on and see what happens. Well, a red light comes on. I'll just have a look at the batteries. This has some batteries in, fairly spurious batteries, so I think it's been tested in the shop. And I'm going to change the batteries in the transmitter for four Duracell batteries. I generally use Duracell batteries because they seem to last a bit longer than some other ones. And as you can see, they are double A size, they neatly fit in the back of the transmitter, and the light comes on again, this time powered by Duracells. Before sailing this boat, I will replenish all of the batteries, but just to test the system, I thought I would fit the four batteries that I took out of the transmitter into the battery holder. Futaba Radio Control uses a different system to other companies, inasmuch that there is a small plastic lug on the plugs, unlike this one which is a high-tech plug which doesn't have one. And here's another type of plug with just two wires. The middle plug in this clip is a high-tech connector, as is the one on the left-hand side. But as you can see, on the right-hand side it's a Futaba. If you have a look at this Futaba receiver, you may notice there are some notches in the plastic body of the receiver next to the pins. And the idea of these notches is that when you use a Futaba plug, you can only put it in the right way around. But I'll be using Tower Pro servos which use high-tech plugs. But the connections are very similar. As shown in the previous clip and again here, the positive wire is always in the middle, and the negative wire is black on Futaba and brown on high-tech. The orange wire on high-tech and the white wire on Futaba is the signal lead from the receiver that tells the servo what to do. When using a radio control system, whether it's an old one or a new one, the protocols must be observed. You always turn on the transmitter first, followed by the receiver, and then when you finish using the radio system, turn the receiver off first, then the transmitter. In this clip, I've put the entire system together with the three servos connected up. So now when I turn on the transmitter first, followed by the receiver, you can see a little jump from the servos, and that's about it. If I turned on the receiver first, there is a possible chance that the receiver could lock to another transmitter and suddenly the servo ranges would be entirely wrong and there is a possibility that the servos could then be damaged. So don't forget, transmitter on first, followed by receiver. When you finish sailing your boat, receiver off first, followed by the transmitter. These are Tower Pro metal geared servos. I've never had any trouble with them and they're very powerful, as you can see by the amount of torque they generate. I'm plugging the servos into different sockets on the receiver to show what happens. The servo on the right will be used to operate the gas cutoff valve, and all the gas cutoff valve needs to be is either on or off, so an on-off switch will be fine. I always like to know what the state of the battery is in the receiver pack. 
In this case, they will always be OK because they are effectively new batteries every time they're put into the holder. Two or three years back, I bought six of these. This is called a Volt Watch, and it tells you what the state of your battery pack is. The hard part of this installation is going to be figuring out the layout of the servos. The vintage metal hull steamboat has never had radio control in it before, and I want to do it in such a way that it's not invasive. So I intend to put these three servos very close together in a robust mahogany box that will be bolted underneath the stern part of the deck. The left hand servo will operate the regulator, the servo in the middle will operate the rudder, and the servo on the right hand side will operate the gas cutoff valve. And I should be able to do this, I think, without enlarging the hatch. This is a restoration rebuild, it's not a new boat. It will be very easy to get an angle grinder and take out a big chunk of the deck, but that's not how the boat was built, and I want to retain its original character. In this clip, I'm using my steel ruler just to figure out how big the box needs to be to hold three servos and maybe the battery or possibly the receiver. When I sat the engine in the boat, I realised that the regulator was facing the wrong way, so I turned it round, and this made the displacement lubricator much more accessible, and the operating arm of the regulator is now in line with the operating arm of the servo. A very kind viewer brought me some really good mahogany, and he was telling me that this mahogany was cut from the window frames that had been in his father's house for about 50 years, and apart from some rot at the bottom of the window frames, the rest of the mahogany was in really good condition. So here I am working with this mahogany, and I'm going to make a box. This is very experimental. It may not work out, it may be a total disaster, but I have to start somewhere. I'm starting by sticking the pieces of mahogany together that I've cut on the bandsaw with some cyanoacrylate adhesive and I've just realised that I'm running very low on this stuff, I need to buy another bottle or two. Making a box is a very simple job, but it can go horrendously wrong. You need to make sure that everything is square to start with, and then it should be plain sailing. This cyanoacrylate adhesive, also known as CA glue or super glue, grabs very quickly, but it still takes a while to set properly, so I'm putting a weight on top of the piece of wood, by way of the hammer that lives under the bench, and now I'm going to go make a cup of tea and leave this for about an hour and a half to set. I don't mean that it's going to take me an hour and a half to drink my cup of tea, but just for a change in the north of England, today is a very nice day. So I think I'll sit in the garden and listen to the beautiful sound of the blackbirds singing. So that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.